Okay, great. That looks like we're all ready to go now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and spending your time with us today. My name is Jennifer Blundell. I'm the International Marketing Manager here at Premier Codex. I will be your host today and I'll just run you through some details first and then we can get started. So welcome. This is our second webinar in our Formation Damage series. Justin Green will be presenting for you today um, and he'll be giving you some expert insight into the question, does shutting in wells create additional damage? We obviously hope you'll get as much value as you can from the session. So we'd encourage you to interact with us as much as you would like. Let us know where you're watching from, participate with us and ask any questions you might have throughout. Questions can be answered by entering them into the Q&A in your Zoom control panel, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. There is a chat function available as well, but for any specific questions you might have for Justin during the session, it's best just to use the Q&A and he'll be able to pick them up from there. For anything that can be answered easily, Justin will stop every so often to answer these for you. We'll aim for the session to last around 45 minutes today. Any questions which may be a bit more in depth or maybe need a fuller answer, we may leave these, these until the end, but we can also factor in some further time for questions at the end as well. So without further ado, I can now pass you on to Justin Green, our presenter today, and he will just give you a short intro and then he'll get us all started. Thanks, Jennifer. So thanks for attending everyone. Um, my name is Justin Green, part of the Formation Damage team here at Premier Corex. Some of you who are not familiar with that name may have known us as Corex. Uh, we were acquired by the Premier Oilfield Group, who we're now part of two or three years ago now. And the Premier Oilfield Group were spread worldwide. We have big lab here in Aberdeen, where I'm talking to you from, and our head office is across in Houston. We have a number of labs across there in the USA and also Cairo, Noida, which is in Delhi in India, and a new lab which has just opened in Abu Dhabi, and likewise a new lab which has just opened in Kuwait. So uh, Premier Corex are expanding as we speak. So this is the second in our series of formation damage webinars. Uh, last week I did a, sorry, two weeks ago, did a, a little talk on what is formation damage and why should we care. Today, we're gonna to zoom in to something a bit more specific and talk about well shut-ins. So as Jennifer said, please just fire away in the question answers box. And if I can see them when we talk, I'll answer. So I will hide myself now and we'll hopefully have some questions when we talk. So today's subject is well shut-ins. I think very relevant in the current climate shut in right at the top at the moment I think is economic reasons wells not producing at the level they need to to justify their status economically alongside the more traditional ones we've seen over the years batch drilling of wells waiting on rigs both of them very common now drilling a series of wells and coming back to them to finish the completion or bring them onto production at the same time rig schedules permitting so wells shut in, being shut in for variable amounts of time as the developments are drilled annual maintenance planned maintenance unplanned maintenance and shutdowns seasonal shutdowns and then work over you know before work overs during work over after work over there's going to be times when wells are shut in treatments various things these are all things that are going to cause wells to be shut in and what I want to talk about today is something very specific, which is what impact these shut-ins and pauses can have on the reservoir in terms of formation damage. So that's what we're going to talk about, not about other issues, purely thinking about the reservoir, what could go right and what could go wrong, and how we could just understand that and maybe try and avoid that. So the main question that we've titled today is, does shutting in wells create additional damage? And I want to answer that straight out of the box. Maybe. As always in the world of formation damage, it's difficult to get a precise predictive answer about individual wells without diving back down deeply into them. So unfortunately, for a nice simple topic, there's no such thing as a simple answer. So with that in mind, what I'd like to think about during our presentation today are a few things like, OK, if there's a potential for additional damage, what might be the sensitivities that could cause that damage when we're shutting the well in? And so what do we need to consider in the context of formation damage related to that? We know that these are variables that change from well to well, from field to field, from bed to bed, from fluid to fluid. So the things that cause this damage may well vary. 
I one thing I'd like to come back to at the end, but I'd like to keep in mind when I'm showing some of the case studies I'm going to show is, are we missing things in what we traditionally do in the industry? The majority of testing done by by fluid vendors, by in-house labs operators, and by independent laboratories such as ourselves are relatively short term and don't reflect the actual well shut-in periods or anything close to that. Does that mean we're missing something, overestimating, underestimating, or does the data from a short-term test and a long-term test normally look the same? So I'll come back to that as well. Now, why do we need to think about long-term? So I'm gonna show the data you have on screen just now in more detail later on, because uh, this is from one of the case studies, but I want to maybe say, I think there's probably two reasons why we want to think long-term. Number one of that is technically, and the second one of that is financially, financially and economically. So I have a data set here, which I'm, which I'm gonna show you later. Uh, we have a series of, of simulations where we started off with no soap period on a, on a core sample. I went right up to six months in various steps. Don't worry about the data just now, but we can see that at this point in this study, with no extended soap, we were something like 70 something percent. And after three to six months, we were down to 50 something. So we've got these two data points here, which is exactly the same simulation, exactly the same lab core flood, the only difference being time. And between those two data sets, we have a performance gap there of around 15% in permeability. So the question one is, does this matter? I mean, you could, you could just say, no, it doesn't matter. I think that's both of them, those are acceptable to me. I'm not sure that's a good argument technically. I think that technically doing our jobs properly, maximizing the potential for a well to flow well and to maximize hydrocarbon recovery and early production, which is, which is a lower risk than longer production, then we need to be trying to find out, okay, if this does get worse with time, why does it get worse with time? So technically, I think there's a really good argument to say I should be understanding why things change and making better decisions based upon that and saying to our bosses, this is why we need to do this. This is why we need to consider this. So technically, there is a difference in this, this first data set here. And then I want to extract that and think about it where, the way our bosses, our shareholders, our our, our governments think, which is into economics. So another reason we should care is money. Now, I showed something similar to this on the, the first webinar as well, and I'm not trying to say that if you have 10% reduction in permeability or 10% formation damage, that's gonna to relate to 10% loss of productivity in the field. It can, but it might not. All I'm trying to illustrate here is the significant impacts we can have from small changes in the level of damage. So in this previous slide, the performance gap, and this is real data, is about 15%. So I've taken what I believe to be a very conservative example here. I'm not trying to wow you with numbers. I've said production is 1,000 barrels a day, $25 per barrel, 300 days of production per year over 10 years. That equals 3 million barrels, which is $75 million of oil at that $25 per barrel. So if we go straight to the bottom here, we have, this is the undamaged version. And if I take a 15% performance gap that I showed you in the last slide, that equates to almost half a million barrels less and over $11 million of differential if all that damage translates to loss of production. Again, I'm not trying to say it does, but if half of it does, we're five, six million dollars. If 10% of it does, we're over a million dollars just from seeing a degrade in performance with those specific fluids in that specific well scenario. So I think that's a second, my second compelling argument why we should consider long-term shut-in as something we should want to know about because financially it can have a hit on, hit on our well, hit on the value of the well and impact on hydrocarbon recovery. So that's the background. That's why I think we should be considering this because we want to do the best job we can and we want to get either the rates, if that's the imperative, that's the metric from our management, or we want to get the value from it if that's the shareholder value they're looking for. With that in mind, let's talk technically now then so let's think about if we if we do decide we want to look at it what are the things that we do in the well in the reservoir section that we could see get worse or change with time and then after that i want to think about what related to those things that could change could cause damage and what kind of mechanisms could we see now i'm going to cover here basically anytime we shut a well and when i come to the case studies there 
but there, there's a pair of case studies in there, a really good pair, and they're actually on a reservoir where we, where the shut-in was before production. I'm more than aware that a lot of the shut-ins that are happening right now are on currently producing or injecting wells. So I'm going to talk about that as an aside before we get on to the case studies. But so I'm covering all the examples here, you know, shut in, what could happen. So the key sensitivities, and there are more than this, but these are ones I've picked out that I think are probably the key ones to think of in any well scenario. And that is, firstly, the rock itself, the native mineral and its compatibility with the fluids that are being introduced to the reservoir through losses, through squeezing, through mud cake, whatever. So like, we're talking about minerals, clay, framework grains in, cla in, in, in plastics and in carbonates. We can have matrix minerals uh, as well. So mineral compatibility with drilling, completion, treatment, work over fluids. Second up is these operational fluids and their compatibility between the reservoir fluids. And that by this, I mean oil and oil wells, water and water legs, gas, maybe, maybe not as significant. And then in oil, all well types we've got formation brine that can interact with the operational fluids and we can also include here um water breakthrough as well so in a producer i could, wouldn't call it an operational fluid but if the water breakthrough is a different chemistry to the native uh, brine then we can see incompatibility there changing behavior of operational fluids and cakes i'm thinking about time here so if we have a mud cake sitting in a well and leave it for a while does it stay exactly the same not necessarily and if it if, if the not necessarily happens then that means there's a potential for it to get change in properties does it become runnier does it become more solid so change in behavior operational fluids uh let's say we're suspending a well with a kill pill if it's an lcm type pill does it slump with time if it's a cross-linked polymer does the cross link stay linked for the time that we need it to stay linked if it doesn't if it loses its uh its uh, fluid loss control properties are we isolating the reservoir or are we not? If the reservoir is isolated and the, the pill breaks down, then it maybe isn't such an issue. But what if we need to control losses? So time is a definite impact there. In reservoirs that have got hardware, uh, sand control hardware, liners, they should be tested to be compatible with the metallurgies and the fluids in the well. But time always can make a difference on there. If we're, For example, if a well is shut in with an acid generating enzyme in hope, and we think that it's compatible with a stainless, stainless steel type metallurgy. What if it isn't? And what if we do quick little, little te quick tests and we end up finding that there's actually over time it gets worse as you'd expect it would. Another thing that classically gets worse with time is souring and bacterial activity. So the longer time, the longer that you expose either bacteria you bring to the well to a new food source or vice versa you have bacteria in the well and you give them a new food source, the longer you have that exposure, it could be like a snowball effect. You know, in short term tests, it's very difficult to pick up bacterial things in without accelerating it with something like growth media. In real world, you don't have that. And so time is a critical coefficient on, on bacteria. So that's the kind of sensitivities I see. But then what does that relate to in the reservoir is what we're thinking about here. Formation damage, what, what, what's the damage related to some of these? And again, there's more than I've got here, but I'm just picking out a few key ones here. Things that we've seen often. First one is operational fluid cake baking on. So that's the kind of change of behavior of operational fluid and cake. I'm using baking on to mean with time, the cake, rather than becoming more easy to remove and fluidizing, which is what I've written down here, cake breaking down and high losses. So that's one thing that can be positive or negative. If with time, the cake becomes more easy to remove, that's a positive for production cleanup. But if we still need to maintain fluid loss control, that could be a damaging mechanism and a well control issue alone. Going back to the fluid cake baking on, we, if the, that's the opposite of that. If we have the, the cake becoming dehydrated or more solid or sitting there at that interface between the well bore and the well in an open hole or in a perforation tunnel in, in a cased and perforated reservoir, if that becomes more difficult to remove, that's a damaging mechanism we wouldn't predict with a short term test. Saturation change, fluid retention, you know, the the thing that we see in rocks is that their petrophysical properties determine how they interact with any fluids we introduce to them that are not native. So if we've got filtrate operational fluids sitting in the pore network and we leave it exposed for a longer period of time, that's a, a, a much greater chance of things like wettability and saturation being able to change short term exposure.
we're conditioning samples on uh, oh I'm sorry sorry one second there my microphone disconnected uh, so if we if we have long-term exposure to fluids we may see saturation change uh, organic and inorganic precipitation by organic precipitates I'm talking about uh, waxes, asphaltines, resins, and inorganic precipitates scales from changes in conditions, maybe with injection water being in there, with breakthrough water of a different chemistry, or by temperature or pressure changes. And the scale in a static situation can develop over time, place swelling, finds mobilization. If we have lower salinity fluids sitting in the pore network, that's a big opportunity if the wrong type of clay is there for it to be exposed and start to swell up and there's a high risk potential there at that point. Fines mobilization, you know, incompatible fluids causing fines, the bonds that are holding the fines together to become less strong and with time potentially causing that so that when we come back onto production we see uh, fines migration. I talked about cake breaking down, corrosion. I'm not really going to talk about the hardware in this, this, this webinar, but you know, if there's a treatment fluid sitting in the well, for example, the longer time, the more chance there is for that. And as I said, on, on the microbial activity, if we have some food source and some bacteria and we give them time, yeah, we think of it as a souring facilities handling safety problem. But in the reservoir, there's potentially cells, polymer being generated blocking up pores, causing damage. So that's examples of the type of key damaging mechanisms that could get worse with time. Now, I'd just like to do an aside, as I said, I was gonna do about shutting in of currently producing and injecting wells, because I'm gonna show you two case studies next, and they're on pre-production shut-ins followed by production. So I just wanna take a little aside to think, okay, what subset of mechanisms could be very relevant to operators who are shutting in wells right now? And these are the key ones that I picked up, I picked up there. So uh, first up, in interaction between reservoir and operational fluids. So depending on what point of the well life cycle the shut-in is at, depending on if there's still some fluid sitting in the near well bore, we could have saturation change, fluid compatibility issues. Fluid cakes, you think, okay, we've had some production, mud cakes shouldn't be an issue, but we know from all the thousands of, of core flood simulations that we've done that mud cake doesn't just disappear lift off you know we don't start a well bring it onto production and the mud cake disappears no it tends to sit there on the outside of the of the well bore and then pinprick wormhole channel as we start to flow and channels and wormholes open up as flow increases and hopefully it cleans up enough so that it's not having an impact on permeability but it's still a fluid cake there and when we shut the well in there's a potential for that to kind of recreate damage if you like so even in a well that's been producing for a while mud cake can still potentially an open hole cased and perforate depending on what the perforation fluid was a well that's been suspended still has a potential to create damage fluid fluid compatibility now the, the key one here i think in, in a shut-in well is going to be something like scaling so depending on what fluid is sitting in the pore network when we shut the well in, we've got this kind of static incubator at that point. If we have water that's broken through or injection water sitting in there, then we've got a high risk potential for scaling and precipitates to begin to develop if the chemistry is right and the conditions are right. This is easily predictable, easily understood, but this is one that is a definite risk for, for shutting in of current producing wells. I talked about clay fines just a minute ago. So, you know, like depending on what fluids are there, if we're sitting statically with the wrong chemistry, the wrong clays, then we are potentially causing trouble. Now, everyone can, has a fairly good handle on swelling because they think, yeah, the salinity of the fluid, and if we have smectite or other swelling clays there, we have a risk. But then we have to remember other clays as well. This is kaolinite clay in this image. And you can see all these plates of kaolinite. And kaolinite is held together by static forces. So let's say we change the pH or we change the salinity of the phase that's sitting in the pore that has a potential to break those static van der Waals forces and kind of overcome them and make them susceptible to movement. So when we flow, start to flow through this pore, here's a pore, so there's some sand grains, and here we have a pore throat. So if this is weakly held together and it's even less strongly held together when we start flowing, it doesn't take much to push a clay plate to that pore throat and start to create damage that the time was a coefficient on. It's also well known or becoming more well known that clay finds migration in a kind of static flowing situation has a time coefficient. So I think we could probably extrapolate that to in a shut-in situation as well. Bugs talked a little bit about bacteria as well. This is a image here of uh, insoluble metal sulfide 
that's in a poor network that's caused by just long term. When I say long term, I'm talking months rather than days. Um, long term growth of bacteria and the byproduct of the souring has been this insoluble metal sulfide, which is a damaging mechanism. It's these little one micron sub micron crystals, but they're sitting in a pore and blocking the pore. And then last up, I talked a bit, I think this is very relevant and currently, especially currently producing and injecting wells is hardware as well, depending on what the suspension fluid is, is there any potential for it to corrode the hardware? And that, that's probably the one that's easiest to understand of all the ones we talked about, but let's not forget about it. So that's just a, a side on the shutting in of current producing and injecting wells. What I'd like to do for the rest of the presentation is just illustrate some of the specific conclusions we've made, some of the things we've seen, and you know the good and bad sides of shutting in wells with a couple of specific case studies. And as I said, I don't think we can examine all of these in a, in a little session. So I'm gonna kind of, the examples I have concentrate on these ones here. So mostly the native mineral compatibility, a little bit of the fluid compatibility as well, the change in behavior of operational fluids and cakes, and these mechanisms at the bottom are the key ones that we saw in these studies, which I said, again, this is real data, so this is real world data, and I think it's really useful to show us, uh, show us what we saw. So these are two fields that are actually pretty close to each other. So this is North Sea. These are oil reservoirs, sandstones, good permeability. So we're talking hundreds, higher than hundreds of mill Darcy's permeability, relatively poorly consolidated reservoirs, which means they required sand control from day one. So that was part of the drilling completion. And the sequences which we used in the reservoirs were broadly similar, which is excellent for allowing us to at least have a go at looking at comparing a couple of scenarios. Of course, there's variation. So let's not say it's one to one relationship, but it's really good at giving us some contrast, uh, some contrast here. So here's the operational sequence that was carried out. And as I said, very similar in both wells. It was drilled. And in the first case study, it was an oil based mud. In the second case study, they still hadn't decided. They looked at one oil based mud, a couple of water based muds. Both wells were then displaced out with, in the first case study, it was just called an LS, low solids OBM. In the second case study, it was a water based or oil based screen running fluid. It was the same difference. It was a fluid to dis displace the mud away and run the screen in. So it's same difference at this point, it was related to the drilling fluids that were used. Then a screen was run. So in the case study one, it was a wire wrap screen. And in case study two, it was a weave screen, similar sizes actually as well, so of aperture. And then there was a soak period. So both of these were gonna be shut in for more than one year, these wells, but it was down to what the operator had the time and appetite to do. So the first operator actually got us to start five, simulation simultaneously so we did one that was basically instant we did a one day soak and then we did a four eight 13 and 26 week soak so we did six three two and one months so it meant that they gradually got data as the project went on seeing how things were evolving the other operator for time and budget they did a no soak which is very similar to this one and then we did three months which is a direct comparison to our 13 weeks here so they just did a to see what happened after three months the other major difference with the result with the studies was that with case study one, the soak happened after the screen running fluid was displaced into the well, but before the screen itself was run. They came back, ran the screens, then brought the well into production. In case study two, they ran the screens, then put the well into suspension before they could bring it back onto production. So the slight differences, but it doesn't make any difference in the conclusions I can make from this for you. And then for both, uh, both case studies, we did the similar stuff. We did a 3D alteration modeling with micro CT scanning. We did some microscopy on the screens. And we did some electron microscopy, some scanning electron microscopy. And I'm going to show you all that because it gave us fantastic insight into what caused changes with time. So case study one, and this is the graphic I showed you at the start. So first up, just to explain what we're seeing in the graphic, as I said, what we did in this, this, uh, this case study was it was drilling mud was applied to build up a drilling mud cake. Then that was a, that was a reservoir overbalance, reservoir temperature, reservoir pressure. Then that was displaced at a reservoir overbalance pressure and an appropriate rate with the, the screen running fluid. In this case, the shutted was performed at that point. Then we came and ran the screen into the, into this, into the sample or a standoff distance. It was a standalone wire wrap screen. And then we produced. And the, what the graph is showing is the permeability. So the initial baseline permeability was 100%. So if we see it all the way down at zero, we've lost all the permeability. And if we see it, about 100%, we've lost no permeability. And what the red block is, is as I said, we ran this operational sequence, soaked it, ran the screen, 
and then performed a production period, a drawdown. We started off at a relatively lower or lower moderate drawdown uh, pressure and that's what the red block is and then the operator wanted to do a second one where they increased it a bit to see what happened with that higher drawdown or higher rate through the wellbore so the red is the initial product production permeability after a first period of production we did a second drawdown of production period which is the yellow block so the increase there is the improvement after increased the drawdown and the blue block is what happened when, after the, after the simulation was finished, we then looked at it, and if there was external operational fluid cake, I'll call it operational fluid cake because there's drilling mud and there's displacement fluid, so it's a combination of the two, really. We removed that, and that's what this blue block is here. So we see a jump like we do at the top one here. That's actually showing, you know, that's 10 odd percent. That shows that the operational fluid cake was having an impact. It was a choke on permeability in this scenario. So we can actually get a bit of interpretation on in this case, the, the mud operational fluid cake was causing an impact on permeability. And then finally, we do this thing called spin down, which involves using centrifuges so that we can give a comparable baseline permeability. But also, some operators like to think of this as a long term permeability, you know, best case. Here and here, we have been doing real differential pressure production simulating the reservoir here we physically removed mud cake which we can't do we can't we can't scrape off a cake in the reservoir normally in an open hole reservoir we can't centrifuge a reservoir but what this does tell us is like at the end of the study if we've removed all the fluid that can be removed what's our kind of irreducible damage in this core sample and here you can see in a with no extended soak it's you know above 90 percent which is a pretty decent result and the initial onset of production is lower about 70 percent most people would consider this 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 original one a pretty okay result and they wouldn't be hugely concerned about that the mud cake is potentially having an impact here so there's some room for improvement if we can make this blue block turn into the yellow or red blocks we're going to be in an even better place so there would be some more comments or investigation no matter what but the conclusion i want or the the data i really want to show here is what happened with time which is you know the shut-in is what we're talking about today and we've got all the measurements going on with time i should say that there's a dotted line down the blue block from the second one on because when we did this first one we saw oh okay is that the screen getting blocked or is that the mud cake itself so what we did was we broke that into two stages where we took off the screen and measured permeability which is the first half of the blocks and then we re-measured it after we've taken the mud cake off which is the second half so this one it's the screen is having some impact and the mud is having somewhat more of an impact but by the time we get to this 13 week and 26 week the screen is kind of steady but the mud cake level is increasing so that's one conclusion we got we could see i think there's two main conclusions we want to talk about here so from no soak to let's say three months and it kind of levels out the overall levels they kind of decreases so it decreases by that 15 odd percent that i talked about at the start so we definitely were seeing an evolution with time and then we were seeing you know this blue block is really interesting i think because with no soak we were seeing that it was having an impact and then we see that impact going down a bit and then gradually growing again with time. So like, this is difficult to interpret, but maybe with a bit of time, the mud was becoming a bit looser and then something else was happening as it sat there in time. And we wanted to have a look at that. And I'm going to show you some of the data to try and understand that. And we can see that the screen what certainly was having some impact. It looked like it was getting blocked a bit, but it seemed like to us something significant was happening in the cake. So we wanted to look at that further. So the conclusions from the perm, data here was yeah there was something happening with time we're seeing something like 15 percent difference between not shutting in and shutting in for three to six months and as i said this well is going to be shut in for maybe a year or more so this is something the operator wanted to look at a bit further if we could understand why this was happening they could see if there was a workaround for it so the first bit of data we used was 3d alteration modeling and this is just a slide here for anyone who hasn't seen this technique before. So this is something we've developed that utilizes uh, micro CT scanning. And what we do is we scan the core sample that we use for the study at initial reservoir saturation. And we scan it in very high resolution, so sub 10 micron resolution. And we take a thousand scans each in the X, Y and Z direction through the core sample, which gives us this really great 15 odd gigabyte, really good quality data set of what the sample was like at the outset, looking at pores, looking at grains, looking at what's inside the pores. And then we rescan it at the endpoint of the test. And you can see here, this is an endpoint one. I can see there's a mud cake sitting on the outside, but what I can't see is what's happening inside. So what we do is we overlay those two data sets on top of each other. And then 
in the computer computationally. We line them up so that the data sets are aligned perfectly, grain to grain. And then at every single point where the data intersects, which is about 300 million points in a typical sample, we can then say, are you the same? Are you different? If you're the same, go invisible in the third image. This is this image minus this image equals this image. And you can see most of the things that are the same are invisible. And only, only what's left behind is where the change is. And we've also um, visualized the intensity of the change. So we can actually see the inlet, the well bore face here. There's a mud cake which hasn't cleaned up. There's an internal filter cake which has gone in a few pores into it. And then inside the sample, we have a few scattered changes. So it's very valuable for visualizing depth of invasion into samples and actually somewhat for looking at what causes specific changes. So I'll show you this for the case study. So first of all, distribution of damage. So this is, I've cut out the uh, no-soak one and we're just looking at the, the ones with four, eight, 13, 26 weeks. So what we can see is, this is uh, through the side of the sample, we've got this zone of change at the well bore at the inlet. And then we've got some scattered change inside the sample. And what we're really seeing is inside isn't really changing much with time. So what went into the sample wasn't really evolving too much. If there's something blocking this pore here, you know, it stayed blocking the pores there. The nature and thickness of the mud cake hasn't changed a lot. I mean, it is worth noting that in the 26 week one, the mud cake didn't shift as well. This is after production. So the mud cake, there was a thicker mud cake sitting there, but generally speaking, we're not seeing much change here. I mean, you know, the, what the sample looked like at the end of the study didn't change much except for this 26 week one. So first, co first comment is we, we thought there was, the, the mud was having, was helping cause the, oh sorry, the operational fluid cake was causing the issue, but visually it wasn't changing much. The distribution of damage wasn't changing very much. So something had to be changing in the nature of this zone. So this zone itself was important. There was something changing in it. So what we did was we zoomed right into the imagery that we took with the CT scanner. And this is where we butted up against technology a little bit. This is a few, few years ago now, not a lot of years ago, but the scans we could take on core samples, you can see we're hitting resolution. So what I have here is the, where I'm moving my pointer now is the inlet, the well bore face. Below it here, this is the reservoir rock. You can see grays for the grains. White is denser material, black is the pores or, or uh, less dense material above the pointer where it is now, this is into the annular space. So there's a mud cake. So you can see this kind of gray shadow there. And then this is probably oil and mud mixed together sitting above it. And we've got this zone here where you can see where I'm moving the pointer through. Now that is the kind of mud, internal mud and there's an external mud there. So after four weeks, you can see what the mud looked like. It's generally fairly homogenous. We're seeing some denser and less dense patches, but it's fairly homogenous. But what starts to happen after this four, four weeks, and as we go to eight weeks and 13 weeks, is we're starting to see the mud cake becoming more heterogeneous than homogenous. And these got these white areas, which are higher density and black areas, which are lower density. So essentially the, the operational fluid cake is changing with time. We're seeing it can become more heterogeneous, less consistent. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of reached its maximum heterogeneity. This 13 weeks seems fairly similar after the 26 weeks as well. So we're, so we're seeing that the mud cake itself had evolved with time. So that was an interesting conclusion, you know, what had happened with time. And it was in this case, it was down to this, just this few millimeters inside and outside the well bore of the core sample, which was the control on most of the damage in this reservoir. This is my example where I said of baking on or the damage becoming stuck with time in the near well bore. This is a classic example of that. And then we zoom in with the electron microscope. Uh, and so I've got two here. I've got the 24 hour sample and the 13 week sample. So now imagine this is an electron microscope image. So imagine we're sitting in the well, looking back towards the well bore. So I've taken the screen away so we, we, we can see through it. Uh, and so we're looking onto the, the face where oil will flow will be coming towards us. And after 24 hours, we can see grains. These are sand grains. See sand grains here. We can see pores, so pores are black. So there's a decent amount of black open pore space here. We have got drilling mud constituents, solids, bridging particles, waiting this little scattering of what looks like sugar on a donut. These crystals all over the face are drilling mud or operational fluid constituents. And we are seeing pores block. There's a pore block there. But we're also seeing plenty of pores that are pretty open. So after just the 24 hour, the no soak, we flowed back. We cleaned up a decent amount of the pores that were being blocked at the well bore by the mud. That explains why the permeability was higher. And then we saw the observation from the 3D alteration models that with time it was evolving and the cake was becoming more heterogeneous. And how did that play out on a pore level? 
looking at it in the electron microscope, we're seeing, I mean, you don't have to be a geologist to see that I'm seeing less black open pore space in the right image than I am in the left. I've got some open pores here and here, and there's one there, but here, 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 we're seeing these mud constituents, operational fluid constituents sitting in the pores, stuck in the pores, and we've not managed to get a high enough rate or differential pressure during production to shift them and open up that channel so it contributes to flow. So we can conclude here that, you know, the, the, the baking on or the, the, the mud cake becoming more heterogeneous has had the impact of making it more difficult to shift during production. So now we're starting to explain what the impact of the shut-in was. The screens. So this is an electron microscope image of the screen. So we have a wire wrap screen. So this dark gray area is the wire. And so this area in the middle is the aperture. And you can see there's 300 microns across. This will be a 250 micron aperture wire wrap screen. And we didn't see them totally blocked. We, this is zoomed into one where we saw some blockage. So was, there was open areas of the screen, but where we did see blockage, we zoomed in and we used some chemical analysis to see what was blocking it. And about 20% of that blockage was grains, sand grains, basically, from the reservoir. 80% of that blockage was caused by solids from the operational fluids. So barite, calcite, they were, they were part of the drilling mud. And they weren't getting back to the screen. So not all of it was. The screen was open to some extent, but then there were some areas of the screen that were getting blocked by mud. So we can conclude here that with time, the nature of the operational fluid cake changed, became more difficult to shift, and that of it, which did shift, not all of it was getting back to the screen and flowing away from the reservoir. So there's where our damage was coming from. We could tie in these Im the imagery together alongside the um, micro CT scans, the 3D uh, alteration models to show most of the difference was up here at the top. We saw some fluid retention changing the saturation in the near wellbore area, you know, the first centimeter or two, and then deeper. And we did see some clay finds redistribution, but dominating this, this, uh, this case study was up at the top here, the drilling mud or changing with time in a negative way. So that's case study one. Case study two is a bit shorter because I'm not going to walk you through as many steps on it. This was, as I said, we looked at uh, three drilling muds with a single rock type and with, with and without a soak period. So you can see here water-based mud one, two, and the ore-based mud. I want to talk about the ore-based mud because that means I can directly compare it to case study one. You can see with the water-based muds, the results were not exactly the same, but they were broadly the same with and without the soak period. So, you know, this is a bit worse with the three month. This one, they're more or less the same overall, although you can see there is some in the no soak period, there was a lot of impact from the cake and less from fluid. Uh, then there was less after three months, less impact from the cake, more impact from fluid, which is giving us an indication that maybe the cake was breaking down a bit with time and the damage was changing from solid pores being blocked into fluid sitting in the near well bore. I'm not going to talk about that just now. I'm going to talk about the all-based mud because the operator had a preference for all-based mud for technical reasons, for drilling reasons. They were looking for all-based mud. And what we saw here is the inverse of what we saw with case study one. With no soak period, you can see we're down here, we're in the high 50s. After drawdown, this only had one single drawdown, not two. That's where there's no yellow block. And then after three months, we were up to 70% with this big blue chunk of damage from the mud cake more or less disappearing with time. So this is actually on the surface, looks like a good result. Time was healing this by essentially being a natural breaker for the drilling mud. So the question is what was causing that? Uh, so we went and had a, had a look at that. I'm just gonna compress the, some of the data down rather than showing it over multiple slides here. So I'm gonna show you similar data to what I showed you for case study one. So we actually did a, we looked at the samples before and after the production period with the CT scan. So here we can see the three different muds. So water-based mud one, water-based mud two, all-based mud for sample 38. And you can see before production, we've got the reservoir here. We've got, as we saw very similarly with case study one, we've got that zone of intense change from the mud cake. And then we've got mud going out into the annular space, into the well bore, if you like, or into the well, if you like. And it was very similar. I think these look broadly similar to me. Maybe there's a slightly higher amount of higher density stuff in the all-based mud one, that wouldn't be a surprise because maybe the mud for weighting needed a bit more dense material, dense solids in it. So maybe that's why there's some more dense material. But broadly speaking, we're seeing very similar thing here. Then we produced oil through the core samples, measured permeability and rescanned them. And what we also did was looked at the screens under a microscope as we did before. 
Uh, this is done with an optical microscope and you can see this is a weave screen. So there's the weave of the screen. There's the aperture. Again, I think this was 250 micron screen. And in the water-based mud, we actually saw some whole mud sitting there blocking the apertures with both mud types. Whereas with the oil-based mud, I could, we could only see crude oil. It wasn't even oil-based mud. You can see the dark brown, black crude oil sitting between the apertures. If we picked that screen up, it would have just drained out. With these, there would have been mud kicking around there. So first thing that we saw was the water-based mud wasn't so successful at being produced back away through the screens, but the oil-based mud was. And then looking at it before and after production, I think that the broadly speaking, with the water-based mud, it looked very similar before and after. So that mud wasn't shifting away. With the obvious muds, yeah, this side of the sample, there's still some, some remnants left there, but on this area, there was pretty good cleanup. So we were seeing a better comparative level of cleanup after three months with the oil-based mud than we were with the water-based mud. So that helped us understand what we, what we were seeing. And then just to confirm that data set from the electron microscopy, comparing to what we did with the previous case study, with the water-based mud after three months, this looks more akin to what we saw in case study one. Yes, there's some pore open because it's not, a catastrophic result by any means. It's an okay result. Uh, we saw pores open, but then we saw lots of pores where there's drilling mud constituents and an operational fluid constituents sitting there. Whereas with the oil-based mud, this is a pretty good result actually. Lots of open pores, you can see the grains, only a little bit of mud sitting here and there blocking off pores. So this is a pretty good result actually. So that helped us conclude with from this one, we saw the opposite. And you know, I said it's very convenient that this one was plus 15% from the uh, from the shutter and the other one was minus 15%. But this was real data. So this is just what happened. So from two fields very close to each other, we saw kind of opposite sides of the same coin. So looking at the two data sets with case study one, we saw the data getting more damage with time, more permeability change with time. And that was due to the change of the operational fluid cake and becoming more difficult to clean up and produce away. Whereas with the other one, we saw improvement with time because the cake was coming less damage. So my question there, you know, comparing one and two, we're seeing two different endpoints here. So we're seeing similar rocks, similar conditions, similar sequences and different results because of small variation within them. And that to me demonstrates that, you know, going in blind, looking at the no soak period, we wouldn't know that there was going to be these variations. So I'd be saying to myself, I hope I'm going to have the case study two result. But what if I have the case study one result? There's a 30% swing there. And nobody's going to say that a 30% difference in permeability doesn't have the potential to impact productivity and economic LOL. I'd rather have case study two over case study one. But how do I know whether I've got it without testing it? So that kind of brings me to my kind of final thoughts and conclusions. Before I get to that, I just wanted to say, you know, I've showed you two case studies. What have we seen generally speaking within our database? You know, at Premier Corex, we've done hundreds, thousands of core flood studies, and we've done quite a significant number of ones with long-term shut-ins ranging from a few days to a few weeks to a few months to multiple months, you know, heading on to year. We've done quite a lot of shut-in studies. So what we've consistently seen is that there's a strong correlation between shutting in core samples and seeing a difference in the results when they're not shut in. So we pretty much generally are seeing a difference in results. Not always, though we sometimes see no change. If we see we've seen ones where we've had a good result on the initial short term and we've seen a good result on the on the long term and vice versa. We've seen a bad result at the start and it hasn't got better with time. But then again we've also seen improvements as I've demonstrated with time and worsening. I think probably worsening is more common than improvements. But that's not to say we, do, we don't ever see improvements. Um, unfortunately for everyone, there's no clear trend and we, we don't really see this type of well, you're going to see an improvement. This type of rock, you're going to see an improvement. It's very dependent on the well variables themselves, the fluid, the viscosity, the native fluid, the rock, the what operational fluids we use, how long the soak is. The key damaging mechanisms that we see time and time again, though, this cleanup and in, you know, in, depending where we are in the well life cycle with our shut-in, the cleanup damage, fluid fluid interaction, scale precipitation, um, alteration, dissolution of minerals, reservoir saturation, wettability changes, fines of migration. These are all the kind of key things we see. The ones I demonstrated in, in that uh, case study, the case studies there are ones we see. Question from Ashish. Uh, what was the wettability of the core in the two cases, water wet or oil wet? I couldn't say for sure, but I would ex be extremely 
suspicious it was water wet north sea oil reservoirs i suspect that the framework grains were water wet with the formation brine saturation and the pores the oil saturation was sitting in the pores actually so that's probably what it was so just a couple of uh, final thoughts and questions um and these are i'm throwing things out here as well as sort of trying to be prescriptive here so these are things i want want to ask is does a positive result in the short term mean a positive result in the longer term because i think what we see says not necessarily no. So if that's a risky conclusion to do what we do in industry standard, and let's be honest, the majority of what's done, be it an internal test within a vendor, a, you know, a fluid leak off test, or maybe a, a higher tech test, maybe an operator doing an internal test, a lab like ourselves doing a high tech test, getting close to reservoir conditions, we're spending good money and good time getting close to reservoir conditions, but if there's a knowledge gap there, you know, we can't say for sure we can extrapolate that out to long term. Why aren't we doing more longer, short, longer term studies? That's a question I'm asking. I think we all know the answer. It's people don't leave enough time necessarily to do studies and they don't necessarily have the budget. I'm just saying it's something that is a risk if you don't consider it and you should be considering it. And then the other question is, what's a suitable exposure? I mean, of course, scientifically, we should be exposing the well and the lab sample for the actual time. Um, do people have one or two years to wait for the result of a study? Not necessarily. So it's really down to what there is the appetite, time and budget for. Is six months okay when it's a year? Well, it'll get us some of the way. It's going to give us something better than one month, but what, what's accurate or not? Yeah, Tamrat's just asked a question here. If we have to shut in, a, in wells due to cut in production for unknown period, what well do we have to choose? That's actually uh, that's actually a really key question is what well do we choose? And, you know, broadly speaking, and we in Premier Oilfield Group, we've actually set up, we're we'll it, and it's more focused on conventional, but it's very relevant. We've called it a shut-in task force. And that's the key question they're asking is, if we're having to identify candidates, if we have three wells and we've got to shut in one of them, or 10 wells and we've got to shut in six of them, which ones do we pick? Which and what's our what's our, our our methodology? Do we shut in the ones that are most likely not to come back onto production so that we can maximize our existing production? Or do we shut in the ones that we know are going to come back on better? And how do we know what they're going to come on better, which are going to be least effective? Yes, we've got modeling, yes, we've got predictions, but me coming from a lab guy perspective, I'm going to say that you've got to start thinking about can you use existing lab data or new lab data to help you choose where your candidates are for shut in. And then it, this is tying in Tamrat with the, my last couple of bullet points as well, I think, which is, okay, if we've shut in wells and we've made the best educated decision, can we use this time that we have, you know, this gap where the well is shut in, let's, you know, we're likely to have more time on our hand, especially in the current market. So can we avoid the issues when we come back onto production by using this time to do some studies maybe, or to do some investigation? If we have got well shut in that we're worried there might be an issue with, then why don't we use some of this time if we can find a way of making some budget to study them, see if there's a see if there's a risk. If there's not, everyone's happy. If there is a risk, let's look at options and solutions while we have the time rather than after we bring it onto production. Ah, it's half the rate. We have a problem here. And I'd like to just at that point make something a really important point from our point of view is if let's say we see that there's a emulsion issue and we need to look at breaking that emulsion with a solvent or surfactant let's there's our candidate we know that it's a water and oil emulsion this is a surfactant that can break that we'll just squeeze that into the well and that'll break the emulsion great on paper we need to make sure it doesn't have a side effect on the reservoir changing the saturation changing the wettability with acid if we're trying to dissolve operational fluid constituents what if it has a side effect on the reservoir causing fines migration or causing precipitates so we need to make sure that treatments actually actually work i didn't close off the first case study just to say that i said that they were concerned about the drop in permeability with time what they actually did was they identified because we identified it was drilling fluid related damage they went and looked at a treatment fluid and we did a separate study where we looked at a treatment fluid and we had a very good result afterwards so I've got a question from Yahia here, which says, as aging gives good production in core flood, is the same applying here, keeping in mind wettability changes over time. Yeah, I suppose there's two issues here. There's you know, aging core samples to get them back to initial states. That is one thing, especially in scale and petrophysical testing, the, the thought is to age them at reservoir conditions for as long as possible to give the most 
meaningful data when we're making direct measurements of saturation and wettability and things like that. The issue for, and I'm specifically focusing on information damage, is does aging give good or bad results? That's the variable I'm afraid uh, here is maybe. So a longer test might not give us good results, might give us bad results. The whole point of where we're coming from today is to say these are things we need to think about at least because we don't know the answer. It's not unknown for the industry about longer term aging making a difference. That was my last slide. So as I said, I wasn't going to cover everything on shutdown today. I just wanted to talk about formation damage. Um, so that's a couple of case studies. If you're interested, my email's here. Uh, we've got a little bit of time for some questions. If anyone wants to uh, ask questions, we've had a couple during the, the webinar. So thank you for your questions. If you want to type a question in the Q&A box, feel free now. If you don't have any questions, well, I'll give it a couple of minutes and I'll thank you for your time and I'll hand back over to Jennifer. So hopefully you found something of interest today. As I said, there's lots of things to think about, shut in on what we're doing as an industry anyway with batch drilling, with suspension of wells, and then thinking of what we're doing in the current industry in terms of shutting in candidate wells like Tamrat mentioned. What are the good candidates? What are the bad candidates? Do we already have data to show the potential damaging mechanisms from our short-term study? And what can we think about how that extends into our, our longer term shut-in? Can we use that to help identify candidates? Or do we need to think about using this time we have right now to add some better understanding to it? I don't see any more questions coming in. So unless someone's typing a question in the next, next 20, 30 seconds. Oh, hang on, we have a question. Oh, it's just an anonymous one saying they enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. And then, Sam, just in case anyone else wants to know whether the recording of the webinar will be shared on the website, you should all get an email after this webinar, which will give you a link to rewatch the recording. And I think we'll also be putting the recordings up with time on our YouTube channel. Yeah, someone's saying it'll be on YouTube as well. So it should be on our YouTube channel before long. Uh, if you search for Premier Oilfield Group on YouTube, you'll see there's a Premier Oilfield Group one and a Premier Corex one there for you to look at. So I think that's it. Any, if there's any more questions, just okay, great. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, everyone. We do appreciate your time today. As Justin said, if you do have any further questions, you can, of course, contact us directly. Um, we will also be sending out a link to the webinar recording tomorrow, as I knew, know there was a few questions regarding the slides um, and recording. So, yeah, you can revisit the slides. And if you do have any further questions after that, just contact us directly. Um, Justin will be back presenting again in a couple of weeks time on the 28th of May with a look this time at formation damage mechanisms and identifying what are the most common mechanisms seen in the field and how they manifest and what impact they can have on the reservoir. Next Thursday, the 21st of May, we'll be holding this second webinar in our core analysis and EOR series, leveraging legacy core, maximizing metadata with Jules Reed. And Jules will be discussing how visiting old core and old data with expert support and analysis can lead to a much deeper understanding and can help us get the most from what we may already have. So please do keep an eye on our social pages for more, more information and the registration details. They'll be released shortly. And of course, if you do have any topics you would like to see specifically from us, we are more than happy to cater to anything specific for you and your teams. So unless there's anything more from Justin, um, many thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you next time.